This series on women in science, technology, and business is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Shireen Santosham. She is the Chief Innovation Officer for the city of San Jose. Actually, she works for the San Jose Mayor's Office. Welcome to the show, Shireen. Thank you for having me. So what brought you from the East Coast and other parts that you worked to San Jose, which is the capital of Silicon Valley? Well, I had a very interesting job in tech. I was working with the GSMA, which is the Mobile Phone Industry Association, working on how to bridge the digital divide for women globally. So. Mm. Women um, are less likely to have internet access or less likely to own mobile phones. And so I was working with many of the major telecom companies around the world and doing advocacy around closing this gender gap. And it was a wonderful experience. I got to go all over Africa, Asia, London, everywhere you can imagine. Um, but it was a lot of travel. It was probably over 70% of my time. I was on the road and was looking to move to a different stage in my life and, and be a little more uh, settled. And I met an advisor to the mayor at the Aspen Institute when I had gone there for a conference. And he and I had started talking and eventually started talking about this role. And it was a new role that they were creating. And I literally came to San Jose for one day and it was sunny and beautiful and incredibly diverse and very optimistic and had this wonderful energy. And I got to spend some time with the mayor and I literally thought this is the America I want to live in. And it was a very hopeful place. And so I decided to, to take the job and work with Mayor Licardo. So what does a chief innovation officer do? Sounds very big and exciting. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is slightly different in many cities. Here in San Jose, you know, I really think about how best I can use technology to improve the lives of our residents. At the end of the day, a smart city is about using technology for the people. And the people part of it is very important. So how do we serve our customers really well? What are the impacts? And so, you know, a couple of the projects that I'm working on right now are, one is how can we allow our residents to more easily interact with us? It can be sometimes in many cities, you feel like you're going back in time. It's gnarly. Yes, it's gnarly. You have to call and you're gonna be on hold. And, and so one of the things we're doing this summer is we're launching a, an app called My San Jose. And what it is, is it's a service request. Is this for both Android and uh, Apple phones? That's right, okay. that's right. And um, it'll be released over the summertime and will allow you to report potholes or abandoned vehicles directly through an app. And then it'll automatically get uh, the work orders to, to the crews. So it's, it'll save us time and money on the back end and it'll just make it a much more seamless experience for Can customers. Can you take a picture and then send it to That's you? That's right, yes. It's all geo-tagged and um, will just be a much easier experience. I think our residents want that kind of experience nowadays. Um, another project we're working on is Facebook Terragraph, which is a, a partnership um, with Facebook to think about how do we build the digital infrastructure of the future. So it will be free gigabit speed Wi-Fi in our downtown and other parts of our city. And, and we know in the future, digital infrastructure is going to be a really important part of how we think about things like connected cars. Or, um, and we also know that residents are going to demand higher levels of connectivity, streaming video. As we start to see virtual reality and augmented reality become more popular. And so we're really thinking about that future state. And then the third area I think that's really interesting that we're working on right now is around autonomous vehicles. Yeah, that's the buzzword. I mean, if you're driving up and down 101 in the Bay Area, you see these Google cars all the time. Yes, and you may have noticed we have a little bit of a traffic problem in this yeah. area. And uh, you know, That's an understatement. <laughs> 
San Jose is set to grow by 40 percent in by 2040. So that's an additional 470,000 residents. Right now it's under a million. It's over a million. Oh, it's over a million. Okay. And so if you think about what that's going to do from a traffic perspective, we simply can't have the model we have today, which is a single person in a car uh, moving around. We can't add an, an additional 40 percent of cars. And so how are we going to deal with this, that growth? And we have to really reimagine what our transportation is going to look like. That's where a lot of um, talk is all over the country, I think, mm -hmm. about not only the country, but I think around the world, transportation. How can we revamp or disrupt the transportation network that we have today? That's right, yes. I mean, people are increasingly living in cities, and so you're going to have a concentration of people there. Um, we know if we adopt autonomous vehicles in the right ways, meaning we incentivize shared ridership, we incentivize electric vehicles, that we can have a big positive impact on the environment. And so in San Jose, we will be launching some autonomous vehicle pilots towards the end of the year. We've been in conversations with uh, many companies. We, were, we had a roundtable with the mayor that had about 30 companies last week. Mm. Um, so it's an exciting time to get to know the space and figure out how we can shape it while it's still in the early days. So what's the difference between autonomous vehicle and uh, self-driving? Well, they're the same. They're, um, oh, so the different words. Different words. There's different levels of autonomy. So depending on um, where on that spectrum. So you can be, really, they consider autonomous vehicles levels three, four, and five. And so five is completely self-driving, hands-off. Hands off, and a, a three is equivalent to something like a, a Tesla today. Got you. OK, so this is all in connection with this whole notion of smart city. Yes. So. I have come across uh, cities that want to be happy, like Dubai wants to be a happy city. <laughs> and in India, there's a state that wants to be a happy state. What is the tag for San Jose? Does it want to be a happy state? I think we always want to be a happy <laughs> state. But uh, our, our tagline is that we want to be the most innovative city in America by the year 2020. That's less than four years. That's right. <laughs> So when you say innovative, what paint us a picture on what would be different four years down the road and why San Jose would be known as an innovative city? So we luckily live in the most innovative place on the planet. And so obviously, this is a, a big task that we have a lot of good people working at the city. We have amazing companies to work with in San Jose, and we have amazing residents. And so together, we can really build and reimagine the future for the city. And so when I first joined and was working with Mayor Licardo, um, we worked with our city council to unanimously pass a smart city vision, which has five core elements. So we talk about using technology and innovation, not just for innovation's sake, but to actually have some impacts. And so those things are around building a safe city, building an inclusive city, building a sustainable city, building a user-friendly city, and building a demonstration city. So working with these innovative companies and taking um, their ideas and helping to uh, scale them, test and scale them for impact. And so. What I imagine where we're going to be in four years is it'll be substantially easier to work with the city. When you walk in, it will feel more like a private sector company than it does today. And a, a place where um, people think, think of as, if you want to get something done, you go to San Jose. OK, so that's the label, or that's, that's your destination. Yes. That's what you want. OK, how did you get started in technology? You studied what? Where in, you went to school uh, in Philadelphia. Yes, in undergrad, I studied uh, finance at the Wharton School, as well as international relations at the college. That's interesting. You studied finance. I did, yes. And what drew you to finance? I um, had started, like many uh, young Indian uh, people do studying biology and medicine. Is that because your parents are doctors? Yes, it was because my <laughs> parents are doctors. 
<laughs> and uh, I actually I enjoyed it quite a bit, but felt that I wanted to do something broader. And but that's diametrically opposite, going from biology to finance. <laughs> <laughs> don't you, I mean, don't you think so? It's, it's a whole different uh, strand. It's a different strand, but I think there are lots of very interesting things about uh, finance. And I was, I've always believed that if you want to solve big problems, you have to work across sectors. And it seemed to me that uh, finance and economics was a really powerful tool uh, to think through. And so that's, all, that's been a theme. And then when I went to graduate school at Harvard, at, I, was, I studied again at the Harvard Business School um, as well as the Harvard Kennedy School. And I had always had an uh, inkling for international work. So I had always thought uh, that I'd spend most of my career abroad. And so it is an interesting shift that now I'm, I'm working domestically. Got you. Did you talk to your parents when you made that switch from biology to uh, finance? Yes, yes. Did they, did they have anything to say about uh, economics? Uh, how did you decide upon economics? Well, I decided on it um, partially because when I grew up, I saw the work that um, my father was doing and uh, in medicine um, while we were, when I, was, when I was young, we lived on uh, the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona. And he's a, he's a physician in public health and was doing work on vaccines for children. And it was an amazing, um, he's had an amazing impact on not only that population, but on the lives of children around the world through his work. But I also was very cognizant of health work alone without thinking about economic development and jobs and how do you get people livelihood um, can only get you so far. And so um, I was always interested in how do you make sort of sy systemic change and the intersections that happen across um, these different areas. When did your interest in international relations develop? I mean, you grew up in uh, Fotopachi, Arizona, mm -hmm. Indian Indian Reservation. Uh, did you have, uh, what kind of exposure did you have there uh, when you were uh, yeah. when you're there? So my uh, father, because he did uh, international health, so oh. his posting, his original posting was on the reservation. Um, but we traveled all the time as children because he'd do work all over the world in Egypt or Oh, so in he was, India. you were not confined to the reservation? No, oh, no. Okay. I, t I took my first trip when I was six weeks old to <laughs> India. I have a, a baby picture and a passport. Um, and so I had traveled more by the time I was graduated high school than most people have. Okay. So you had already gotten mm -hmm. that world view. That's right. Of having traveled. And so... What did your travels reveal to you? Uh, how did they impact you? How did they influence or color your thinking? Because that is unusual for someone so young to have traveled that much, right? Yes, yes. For me, it was, um, first of all, just wonderful. I think uh, I love the diversity and the differences between us are uh, something to be celebrated and to see how different people live around the world um, was always, uh, a part of the way I grew up. I think second, it all also gave me uh, an ease with working with people from all walks of life and from all different socioeconomic uh, groups because um, we were exposed to um, so the base of the pyramid populations as well as uh, very um, elite groups through those travels. And it always taught me to be very humble and to look at people for who they are, not for um, that first impression. And so it's been, I think, a, a guiding force in my life. And I, I do fundamentally believe that people are more similar than they are different. Tell me about your mother. She's a doctor. She is, yes. Uh, what kind of a doctor? She's an anesthesiologist. So she worked in emergency rooms for most of her life. That must have been tough if yes. she worked in emergency rooms. It is a, it's a high pressure field. Um, she grew up in Malaysia. She was born and raised in Malaysia and then moved to India for a medical school, which is where she met my father. And then they both immigrated to the United States. And so she had a, 
a long, successful career as an emergency room doctor. And uh, in the communities in which we lived when we were younger, she was very much a part of uh, the community, the, the small community hospital that we that she worked in in Arizona. Um, celebrated her work and still to this day talks about uh, the influence she had. I think she was the only doctor, only anesthesiologist for about uh, 100 miles in this what, rural. What, what's your mom's name? Patricia Santosham. Okay, so, yeah. so she must have had a huge influence on you because you saw a working mother. Yes. Uh, yes who, who had to handle pressure on an everyday basis. Now, so how did she balance her home life, taking care of you all, and then her work? What did you observe? Well, I think it's, it's a challenge that is a challenge that remains today for women everywhere, you know. I think our family has always been uh, not a very traditional uh, household. You know, we traveled. It was very social justice oriented. We always had interesting conversations. And so, you know, my father's a pediatrician, and so they had, you know, they helped each other in, in the house. And um, I think it to be honest, is harder for that generation of women and hopefully is getting easier for my generation. Okay. And did your mother have any input for you when you went to Harvard to do your MBA in international relations? I think they were just very proud, which is always very nice. Okay. You also, so you've, you've got a very interesting uh, career because you worked as a consultant with McKinsey. I did, yes. And then you worked with Microsoft's co-founder, Paul Allen. I have, yes. Vulcan Ventures. How did that come about? How did you get to work with Paul Allen? Well, I had graduated from uh, my undergraduate degree in 2001, which, as you recall, was a recession year. And I took a job working in New York, as many uh, young people at Penn do. They moved from Philadelphia to New York City. And uh, it was not the most fulfilling for me. It was uh, working in an office, and it was fine. It was a good, good job and an interesting time to be in New York City. Uh, but I wanted something that had more social impact. And so I uh, started looking around for what I could do internationally, and I got essentially an unpaid internship with Save the Children in Bolivia, in La Paz, mm. Bolivia. So I got on a plane and I, I went down to work in Bolivia for several months and had taken a leave of absence from my job. And um, How did you support yourself if it was an unpaid internship? Well, the organization housed me, so I had a, a kind of host mom, essentially, who, who took me in, which was very kind of her. Um, and then I did a, a few projects, and it was a very interesting time to be there. I think I, I lived through a coup <laughs> while oh, we were there. Okay. And uh, then it was starting to get to that time where my job in New York was saying, well, are you going to come back or are you not going to come back? And I literally got a listserv um, notice from, from Penn that said, hey, there's this opening at uh, Vulcan Capital, social sector investments. And so I was trying to figure out how I could move into this venture philanthropy space, which was at the time very uh, a very hot term. And I uh, just applied out of the blue and went through, I think, probably seven or eight interviews and then got the position and worked for a woman by the name of Christy Dooley, who was also a Harvard graduate, an MBA graduate. And she became a mentor of mine and, and was actually the person who um, encouraged me to apply to Harvard. And then that's that's how I got in there. Oh, so you had not gone to Harvard then? You had just graduated from? I had from, just graduated, okay, yeah. From Penn and, okay, so uh, what did you learn at Vulcan? Vulcan was a, a really uh, amazing place to work. Uh, Paul is a very visionary um, person. And I learned a, a lot about uh, this cross-sector uh, impact. So how do you think about... Um, so at the systemic level. Yeah, at the systemic level. And also, um, how do you sort of create a new path? So one of the big projects I worked on was standing up a, a neuroscience brain institute called the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, which still exists today. It was about a $100 million gift uh, to start up. And so how do you um, bring together this group of people? So business people with scientists, with imaging, imaging engineers, and get them to work together and um, 
develop uh, new tools. So in this case, we were looking at creating um, a genetic map of a mouse brain. Mm. And it was a really bold project and had, um, I think the past projects had only been completed in 15, 20 years and were pretty simple. And this project, I think we completed in less than, less than five years, I think it was three years, and became um, a, a really fantastic open source tool for researchers. Oh, okay. Yeah. In, in neurology and brain yes, science. Yes, it still exists today. Okay. And, and so you were involved in pulling those people together and what, what was your role? I was an analyst, I was quite young, so a lot of the work was with my boss who, who led and guided the work. So I was learning from her and watching how she worked. Um, and I think that example of, of how she was able to bring people together from different disciplines and create something quite bold um, and support uh, you know, the staff and, and the scientists was really um, inspirational for me. Do you still stay in touch with her? I do, yes. Okay. Do you mentor anybody? I do mentor a few young people mm. um, from different parts of uh, different times in my career. Okay. So from there you went to Harvard and then you got involved with GSMA, which is one, CDMA is one uh, protocol, GSMA is one, the That's other right. protocol for uh, mobile phones. That's right. So uh, when you worked with all these different women uh, all around the world, did you find any difference between the states of Africa and Asian uh, countries? in terms of how women were using the phone? Yes, it's very different across different geographies. So although women globally are less likely to have access uh, to the internet and to mobile phones, um, you see a lot of differences within regions even. So in Asia, for example, um, the gender gap and mobile phone or ownership for Indian women is very, very high, whereas for Chinese women, it's virtually non-existent. Why is that? It has to do with a variety of factors. One is just cost. Um, and so it's cheaper in China? Women make more in China. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so one is that. It, it, but it has a lot to do with cultural norms. Um, and so in India, where we have more, um, more traditional roles, you end up having, um, you know, technology is just a tool and mm. it can reflect the society, society's um, values. And so in societies where women are historically more oppressed, you'll see larger gender gaps generally. But I had an interesting story when I visited India 10 years ago. There was a lady in Bombay who was so desperate to figure out how to use the mobile phone. My friend taught her how to use and she, she was a masseuse. Mm -hmm. And she increased her business tenfold. That's right. You know, so it so is it could it be that if uh, women are shown how to use phones, then they become empowered? Is that something that you noticed in any of these countries? Absolutely, a absolutely. I think getting women the, the technology can have tremendous benefits. So, for example, one woman that I met um, who was working with a nonprofit called Sewa, a very famous yeah. nonprofit in, in Gujarat. Um, her husband had lost his job and the family was in kind of a difficult situation and she had two young boys uh, who eventually needed to get uh, to college or get educated and she lived in a community where she wasn't allowed out of her house, literally out of her house. Um, but slowly through the work of, of Sewa, this nonprofit that was very uh, trusted, they slowly were able to get her um, a job first in a creche and then later uh, helping to sell some agricultural products. And then eventually she got a phone which allowed her to coordinate and, and sell her business uh, products much easier to use mobile money. And through that process, she actually sent both of her boys to college, was able to buy a truck and um, supplies to help her husband and is now a, a leader in her village and in fact I think visited Washington DC at one point. Oh, okay, well, what is the situation of women here in uh, America when it comes to uh, smartphones or uh, mobile phones? Here in, here in the States you really don't see a gender gap which is um, a very good thing. I think the, uh, the But you see a digital gap 
in the U.S.? Do you see a digital gap? You may not in, see a gender gap, but a digital gap. You don't see a gap in access, but if you mean in terms of uh, women in tech and uh, women leaders, certainly we see that. Now, the, since you've got such a diverse background, you know, and you've worked in so many different uh, areas, what is it that you bring to the table in San Jose where you feel empowered every day and you feel like your old mentor who you watched bring different people together and put a plan together for uh, Vulcan uh, Ventures? Uh, do you ever go back to her and uh, uh, get her uh, input if you're stuck somewhere? I do, I do. I still call her for advice and uh, you know, it's wonderful to have um, people like that in your life. You know, we don't get anywhere by ourselves. We always get places together. Um, and, you know, I think because I've had all these diverse experiences, I can speak different languages of How different... How many do you speak? <laughs> of different sectors. Oh, languages. I thought you spoke languages like in German, French. <laughs> yes. Do you speak more than one language? I, I speak more than one language poorly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think you have to be kind of a translator in a role like this, right, in order to bring people together to solve these very complex problems. And so I think that's uh, what I'm able to do because I've had experiences in the nonprofit sector, in government, with private sector businesses, um, with very high level leaders. And so that allows me to navigate and, and uh, convene people, which I think is very exciting. Shireen, it was a real pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, for helping us understand what somebody like you does to bridge the gap and make technology available to regular folks like us. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our shows, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. We'll be back again next week with another edition of our show. Until then, goodbye. This series on women in science, technology, and business is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business.